AccuWeather meteorologist and veteran storm chaser Tony Lawback. Our team coverage of the storm continues right now with meteorologist Tony Lawback, who is out in those elements. Whew. You see a lot of video coming in. They're not all storm chasing professionals right. like Tony Lawback. We're going to take you down to Earth with uh, Tony Lawback. Very nice shots there by Tony Lawback. He was out chasing storms. The wind coming in this direction right across here. So we are seeing that water get pushed up into this. Winds easily, easily gusting tropical storm force at times. It's probably even approaching maybe, you know, we're talking 65, 70 miles per hour. You know, right now this gust even looking pretty good. But we've had people out here kind of checking out the waves, kind of getting an idea of, you know, what the beaches are looking like. Obviously, they're all closed. Certainly nobody wants to be in the water. All the beaches, the waters, all that stuff are closed. So we are going to be seeing that continuing through the afternoon into this evening here as Tropical Storm Ian again starts to work its way back over the Atlantic. Does not mean we're not going to feel these effects here today. As you can see, clearly we are dealing with Ian here in Jacksonville. Just recently, the skies decided to open up here, but if I can get my cameraman to just peek out right here, this just happening. That's the sun you're seeing popping out of the clouds right now. So in the midst of this downpour, we are seeing the clouds starting to clear on up. We're dealing with that here in St. Augustine where we're easily seeing wind gusts topping 40 to 45 miles per hour. That sustained wind, probably close to tropical storm strength all on its own. You see me standing in that right now. We do have that tornado watch that is in effect for us here in Jacksonville. Right now though, as you can see, we're still just dealing with the overall tropical storm conditions. We are seeing wind gusts steadily starting to get into that 50 and 60 mile per hour range. It was a little bit more spotty overnight, but as Nicole starts to work its way a little further to the north, we actually close the gap a little bit between the center of that circulation and us here in Jacksonville. So not out of the question, we see a little increase in the winds despite Nicole starting to weaken as it moves over land. So those tropical storm conditions likely to continue through the day as we get that northward movement of Nicole. You're west of Chicago. Have you ever seen a chase day like this? I mean, have you, how many have you seen now? Three tornadoes? Well, we've actually currently got a tornado ongoing right now. This is just to the west of Virgil, Illinois. You're looking live at this tornado right now. This is off to my west, about two miles off to my west. This tornado has been on the ground for about two or three minutes. It's hard to even count how many tornadoes have been seen today. We've been talking multiple tornadoes. This one, one of the stronger looking tornadoes that I have seen. This is moving again. This is west moving to my east. I'm going to have to move south here at some point as this tornado is approaching my location. Again, this is near the town of Virgil, west of Virgil, Illinois. Large tornado going as we speak. Multiple vortex, it looks like. This tornado is moving to the west or to the east toward the town of Virgil, Illinois. Again, this is all west of Chicago. Multiple tornadoes on storms ongoing right now, guys. About 20 minutes or so ago, we actually watched a very large tornado just uh, to the north of Four Forks, <coughs> Louisiana. That uh, occurred about 20 minutes ago. That storm is making its way into the Shreveport area. What you're looking at on my stream right now is kind of the base of that storm. There might still be a tornado with this. It's hard to tell. We're in an area that's very heavily wooded, so the spotting in this general vicinity has been a little bit tough, but we do know that this storm has produced a large tornado already. Possible it is still on the ground, so folks in Shreveport, especially on the south side and the east side of Shreveport, take your tornado precautions. We do know that this storm is capable, if not producing a tornado right now. We know it has already produced a tornado. <laughs> wind, Melissa. Lots and lots of wind. It's Kansas in April. This is good stuff here. It has been blowing all day. We've seen gusts over 70 miles per hour, and this is not including the thunderstorms, which are on our way up. We're going to go to radar real quickly. We just got a re recent issue here in the last few minutes. Tornado warning. This is a storm that is approaching us from the south. We are currently in Oakley, Kansas. This on the head tail, well, basically the head of a line of storms that is starting to work its way up from the panhandle. These storms, folks, are racing. As you saw, it is very, very windy. You can imagine the storms moving that quickly as well. We're talking 50 to 60 miles per hour on the storms themselves. We have also heard reports of baseball-sized hail in the panhandle. Again, these storms currently working their way quickly from south to north across western Kansas. Watches are up, not just here in western Kansas, but we are seeing those watches. Texas up into the Dakotas as well. This is a much more widespread severe weather issue. Notice though, severe thunderstorm watches, meaning the tornado threat a little bit lower. We're seeing that in western Kansas. You saw the radar, how those storms are lining up. Not usually prolific in terms of tornado
tornado production. We're talking mainly hail and damaging winds. And let's bring it back to me and we'll kind of talk about the winds we are seeing right now technically are severe criteria winds. A severe thunderstorm defined as 58 miles per hour with those winds. A big threat with these is going to be the wind driven hail that we are going to see. And again, with the winds as strong as they are, we're talking maybe quarter inch hail, or sorry, quarter sized hail up to ping pong ball, golf ball size, and the winds that are coming out of these right now could be very, very destructive hailstorms. And we've already had reports of baseball size hail. But again, that tornado warning in effect to our immediate south, that is the storm we're going to start to track. And again, we're going to stay here basically along I-70 and cherry pick these storms as they move up, moving too fast really to keep up with Melissa. But we will be keeping an eye on them here in western Kansas. This is uh, a classic looking supercell here, Adam. You're seeing the striations going all the way up into the mid-levels. The whole mid-level of this storm rotating. Probably going to see some good hail out of it. We've actually had a couple of uh, decent sized stones clunk us here in the last 30 seconds or so but this is the second storm we've seen roll through this area this one also prompting the national weather service to issue tornado warning as this rolled right over the city of arkansas city their second storm of the day fortunately for them and fortunately really for everybody in southeast kansas none of these storms having produced tornadoes yet but we are seeing hail about one inch in diameter coming down around us here now we oh see that sounds great on the hood. So we've got the hail with this. The Most of the hail core is going to pass to our north. So you'll hear a couple of clunks on us here. We're not expecting major hail here. Most of that's going to be just off to the north, but it adds a good ambiance to the report here. But again, you're looking at a classic looking supercell. This right over Dexter, Kansas right now. So we were just uh, up there not too long ago. This storm is going to continue to work its way to the east. The tornadic threat waning with this storm, but as you can hear, going to produce a little bit of hail, probably some flooding rains as well. But yeah, we're talking maybe one inch to ping pong ball size hail coming down and again Adam you can hear it in all its glory coming down on me as we speak ladies and gentlemen I present to you the final day of June into summer where the real feel here in Cheyenne is 48 degrees thanks in part to some of the weather that has moved on through here obviously you can see it's very very windy with a light rain falling fortunately the storms that rolled through here really weakened considerably as they made their way in very pulsy type storms off to the north and east of here up toward Torrington into the Nebraska Panhandle we do have a couple of severe thunderstorm warnings out that way for stronger storms with 70 mile per hour winds we're probably seeing winds here in the 40 to 45 range Rollins though did have one at 60 plus earlier this afternoon. Well, there's a lot of information coming in here. We're trying to kind of get it all organized, but several hours ago, several fires along the front range near Boulder, near Superior and Louisville have sparked up. And as you can tell, it is very, very windy here. The winds have kind of shifted actually over the last 30 minutes now. They're now coming out of the north and east, which I guess is good news for us because that means any fire that we're going to see is going to start blowing off that way. The field behind me just saw some recent flare-ups about a half a mile down the road. This location right here, 96th and Dillon, this is near Superior on the north side of Superior, the south side of Louisville, where evacuations are underway. We know a couple of the hospitals in Louisville have been ordered to evacuate as well. We're seeing a lot of traffic. Nobody can go north into Louisville. Nobody can go west at this intersection. A lot of the westbound traffic that we're seeing are people coming from work trying to get home to their home that are west of here. Of course, officials not letting anybody come through right now. You can hear the ra repeated sirens. We've seen emergency crews coming through here in and out all day since I've been here. Ash falling at this location as well. We're seeing a lot of thick smoke, but again, the winds are kind of rapid right now. In fact, we've got a little gust NATO just off to my, just crossing the road right now. I hope it doesn't run me over, but yeah, a lot of kind of Panic people coming through here trying to get back home, but nobody's allowed to get home right now. We're trying to gather information as quickly as we can, but this is an ongoing situation. You can see again those fresh plumes of smoke there behind me. One of the fires that has just ignited in the field about a half a mile to my west. So a very fluid situation ongoing here. The wind's again now at my back, so we may be uh, moving here before too long here, Marvin. 
The Mayfield fire continues to burn northwest of Denver. Subdivisions in Superior and Louisville have seen hundreds of homes damaged or destroyed by this fire, which started early Thursday afternoon. The cause is thought to be down power lines. We had gusty winds over 100 miles per hour reported in the area during the day on Thursday. Now, fortunately, some good news. Colorado expecting to see some significant snows throughout the day Friday into early Saturday morning, which should hopefully go a long way to containing this fire as we go through the day on Friday. For AccuWeather, I'm meteorologist Tony Laubach in Louisville, Colorado. And the great pumpkin rises from the pumpkin <laughs> patch into temperatures <laughs> somehow colder than it was two hours ago. We'll talk about how long this is going to last coming up. <laughs> I, I, I'm trying to... I can't beat it. I don't think I anyone makes it. me laugh harder than Tony Laubach. Well, really... Bernie, I'm actually currently inside. I've got another dude dressed up as me standing outside doing all the acting for me. So I'm all comfy in my room as well. I'm not. We were talking with Tony about how little snow Denver was receiving so far this winter. That's changed. Yeah, and he was upset about it. But yeah. now look at him. He looks so happy. <laughs> <laughs> well, we we have two problems here this morning, all right? I've been up since about 3 o'clock kind of running around. First of all, I've lost a glove, so I'm, I'm Michael Jackson in here today. And second of all, my ice scraper fell off. So this thing's useless, so I don't even know what we're doing out here. But it is the front range of Colorado. It is March. That means... 70s to this. This is I-25 behind me here. We're south of Denver in Castle Rock. This is one of the areas that has seen most of the snow. We are sitting right about seven inches. This is a heavy, wet snow. I mean, almost to the point you pick it up and it turns to water almost instantly. The drive, it's a slow drive, but it is so far a smooth drive. Really, the biggest issue is west of Denver along I-70 heading up into the mountains westbound. I-70 closed. They call that for safety concerns just with all the slick ice and trying to get up those inclines into the foothills that has been the biggest issue yeah um, I'm gonna quote Han Solo never tell me the numbers okay nobody <laughs> wants to hear that right now real feel or not it is crazy the wagons that are behind me you see Highmark Stadium they're frozen they can't circle them because they're stuck to the ground it is cold out here folks but you know this is Buffalo I'm super excited to be here this is just a very cool atmosphere despite the cold now would I rather be in Tampa eh, probably but you know I'm here in Buffalo and folks are flocking to Buffalo because there's a huge game tonight the Patriots the Bills and folks it's going to be cold when we're talking game time temperatures take a look at the numbers throughout the game here's the bad news folks it only gets colder as you start at 7 degrees and then it just ticks its way down as you get through the rest of the evening we're kind of in the warm-up right now we started off this morning very very cold temperatures single digits low single digits and quiet atmosphere everybody's sleeping in nobody needs to be out here this early because the game not till later this evening so plenty of time to get yourself all set and psyched and ready to go here in buffalo now of course we start to change things a little bit here's the good news going into tomorrow and monday it starts to warm up a little bit the bad news not enough to avoid the snow that we are expecting here significant accumulations are expected in the western new york area that includes us here in buffalo so heavy snow going to be a factor for us mainly later tomorrow later on sunday especially into overnight sunday into early monday morning that's when we're expecting to see the heaviest snow here in western new york so we're going to go from the extreme cold we're going to bring those temperatures up a hair but not enough to get us out of the snow which will be our big concern as we head later into tomorrow and monday so justin we're talking all sorts of winter weather facets here but game wise Here's the question I pose for everybody back home. Would you rather it be the single digit temperatures with no snow or in the 20s with a ton of snow? I would vote for the latter, but we're gonna deal with the cold tonight, Justin. Ladder every time here too. Thanks for that, Tony. Meteorologist Tony Lawback joins us live from Death Valley to show us what he has been working on throughout our broadcast. Tony, what's going on there? You got the spatula. Yeah, I've got the spatula ready because I've got to actually start to like chisel some of this stuff off here. Most of this is cooking in minutes. It's not taking very long for any of this. The only thing that has any kind of substance left to it is this liquefied candy bar. But the ham is crispy. The eggs have all but evaporated and the gummy bears, well, they've been here, there, and now they're everywhere else. 
and hopefully you get that reference. But folks, the heat out here in uh, Death Valley has been something we've been dealing with for the last several days. Believe it or not, it's actually been several degrees cooler today than we've seen the last few days, but still bringing people out in herds. In fact, some of those people coming out to enjoy this heat, we're talking about coming out here to escape their own kind of heat to come out and see an even hotter heat here. So Scottsdale's been blazing hot so far this summer. A lot of days over 110, 115. So on our way to Brookings, we left this morning, we decided we uh, go out of our way to come to Death Valley and go down to uh, Badwater Basin, where I think it's supposed to be 120 this afternoon. And temperatures are continue to be warm throughout the week. And we say warm because we're not talking 130s like we saw over the weekend. We're talking 120s, which I guess you could call a cold snap here in the middle of July, guys. Tony Lawback was the man behind the camera, and he never disappoints. No, he does not. He always gets some good stuff. Meteorologist Tony Lawback is brave in the cold.
week, meteorologist Tony Laubach was in Southeast Colorado chasing storms. This week, he has been chasing something else. He joins us live this morning from La Junta, Colorado. Tony, what is it that you are chasing? Well, I'll give you a little hint. It's uh, this guy on my shoulder. And while he is not exactly a tarantula, that is what you are chasing out here in Southeast Colorado. And folks, I came down here yesterday hoping I would see one. I saw many more than that. In fact, I wasn't the only one running around out here yesterday. This actually is quite the tourist attraction. Visit lahunta.com. You can get all the information on exactly how to come out here and chase down tarantulas. Yes! We just had a feeling we would. He's pretty big. Normally seeing a giant spider would not result in that kind of excitement, but it's a whole different story here in the Comanche National Grasslands this time of year. I think people are excited to see uh, spiders in their natural habitat. They are big spiders. I don't think people are used to seeing spiders of this size. I think it's a, a combination of people wanting to learn, people being curious, and people just wanting to experience something new. It's called the tarantula migration, but it's not really a migration, more of a mate-gration, as the male spiders venture out to seek a mate. And mid-September into the first week of October is the peak season, thanks in part to the cooler weather. And that's when these large spiders are most easily viewed, and it's become quite a draw for many folks. We've known about the tarantulas for a number of years, but we've been uh, promoting them to the locals as well. And so a lot of people that live here don't even realize that this happens yearly. We were getting a lot of questions about it, so we built a web page around it, and the interest in it has just continued to grow year after year. That interest has definitely grabbed some attention. I just heard there was a great spider mi a migration, the tarantulas, and I definitely want to see that. Just the idea that you could possibly, you know, find a, a number of them, a large number of them, and that it's, you know, more or less a reliable kind of thing. But I feel like I have a little better chance if a lot of them are traveling about at this time. And it was. Even I didn't have to drive far across the dirt roads to spot my first one. There's one. Right there, he just crawled into the road. And I wasn't alone. Doug Frank and his wife were out as well, and they drove a couple hours just to get here. We came down from Colorado Springs uh, to look for the spiders, and uh, we were lucky enough to see one here, and uh, they're beautiful. It was a good day. Fortunately, tarantulas are docile creatures and are not severely poisonous to humans, but like any wildlife, respect is definitely the order of the day. They're actually gentle giants and they'll leave you alone if you leave them alone. So we don't want to over love them and we want people to come and enjoy them. Uh, leave them here in their natural habitat so that we can have this phenomena to um, offer to tourists for many years to come. Now we are considering here at AccuWeather making this a team building exercise next year. And Michelle, I heard you were on the top of that list for wanting to come I out here and actually uh, see some of these tarantulas here. I, uh, I don't think I'm joining in on this team building exercise. We're gonna have to find something <laughs> else. Uh, and especially if they were on my head, like they're on yours, no thank you, I can't do that. No, no way. And the Circleville Pumpkin Show wraps up this weekend for the 114th time in the town's history. It's not over yet, though. Meteorologist Tony Laubach returned to his hometown to be part of the festivities. So, Tony, what's going on out there? Well, it is a party here on a Friday night in Circleville, Ohio. It has been many, many years since I've enjoyed one of these. The Civic Parade going on behind me here. We've got one of the floats that's starting to work its way in here. We've got beautiful floats on display. One of the many parades that goes on here during the pumpkin show. We're seeing that continue here through the evening. Friday night, one of the bigger nights for us. Of course, the weekend, that's when most of the out-of-towners start to roll their way in here. And folks, we have 400,000 people people estimated every year that come and enjoy this pumpkin show. For the hometown, my hometown here, it is one of the most prideful things. Everybody in town getting involved with the festivities. Nobody paid that works this. Everybody volunteers. Certainly a sense of huge pride for everybody, not just the workers and not just the town, but for those that have a very personal connection. Circleville, Ohio, a small town south of Columbus that becomes a much bigger one annually during the third week of October. We always think uh, as the pumpkin show, it's Christmas time for us here in Circleville. It is the greatest free show on earth, and just about every year since 1903, this show draws in people from all over the country. We estimate about every year uh, about 400,000 people 
uh, come to Circleville for the pumpkin show. The show has a usual lineup of games and parades, but it's the pumpkins that make the show unique. From 1,800 pound pumpkins to 400 pounds of pumpkin pie, and to putting those pumpkins into every food possible, some a little on the far outside, pumpkin chili! but others hometown favorites. It's just part of being born and raised in Circleville. <laughs> Many have been to pumpkin shows all their life. 1941. I think I have been to every pumpkin show since then except for 1945. And many others are just starting their pumpkin show lives. This is his first and then his sixth and his fourth. It's a joy. It's tradition. We enjoy it. Coming back each year. One of the biggest traditions of the show is the crowning of Miss Pumpkin Show and this year's queen was a first of her kind. My daughter is not a pageant girl. She's a softball girl, right? She's an athlete, you know, and a musician. So all this stuff was foreign to her. I am actually a drummer and my dad has taught me how to play the drums. This was such a last minute decision to be pumpkin show rep for Circleville High School. A decision that will put her in pumpkin show lore forever. This feels so amazing. This means so much to me. I feel so special to represent the Circleville Pumpkin Show for my hometown of Circleville. But for her dad, it means so much more. Her Grammy, my mom, just passed away a year ago on her birthday, and she loved Pumpkin Show, and that was the whole thing. <laughs> What's that? She was saying that it was for her Grammy, you know? It was something, man, and she pulled it off, dude. I'm proud as proudest pie ever, you know? And I'll tell you, there's a lot of pride here in Circleville, Ohio right now. And a little tidbit here, as interconnected as all we all are in this town, Marty there, you just saw at the end of that piece, was actually my first manager at the Pizza Hut I started my pizza career at right here in Circleville, Ohio. So connections all over the place, pride all over the place, means the world to me to be back here, guys. Millions of Floridians were battening down the hatches as Hurricane Ian approached. And for one man, that meant singing to his alligators. Right? Yeah, you heard that correctly. Singing to his alligators. Yeah. All right, well, Tony Lawback introduces us to the Gator Crusader. Everyone else is, you know, trying to evacuate. They're all going the opposite way. I'm driving, like, closer to the storm because I got to go sing to my gators. Yes, folks, you heard that right. Michael Womer drove toward Hurricane Ian so he could sing to his gators. And she's riding a stairway. While Ian was raging to his south, Wilmer was hunkered down at the Suncoast Primate Sanctuary outside of Tampa with his gators. It was pouring rain on me. It was kind of windy. I was a little concerned for my safety, but at the same time, when I almost get into taking care of alligator mode, all I'm thinking about is let's take care of these awesome animals. Let's make sure they're feeling okay. Now I've run to plenty of storms in my day, but never with alligators or any animal for that matter. I knew immediately I needed to show my respect to this man. But the question beckoned, how did you get to this point where you knew singing the gators would get them through a hurricane? I've learned already just through July 4th and New Year's night, because with all the fireworks in the air, I can tell by their body language, they're definitely worried. Uh, they're definitely agitated. And I've noticed if I stay there, when all the fireworks are popping in the sky, if I sing to them, you can see them calm down. Ian is electrifying. Ian fortunately did not directly impact him or the gators, but there was still a lot of cleanup in its wake. There was a lot of mud, a lot of tree limbs, a lot of leaves, so a lot of clean. I mean, it took probably a good two days to clean all of the leaves and all of the muck out of the alligator enclosures. Which, of course, got the gators another show. The world upon your shoulder. But I had to ask, what if you had to evacuate the gators? Just got to catch them all and move them in your truck something both of us hope will never have to happen but if it did no one has any idea what i have in the back of my truck for accuweather i'm meteorologist tony lawback you might think most people in their right mind would run screaming away from death valley and would not come here when it's this hot 
but for a few, it's exactly the opposite. Since hitting 130 degrees on Friday with an AccuWeather real feel at 136, people have been flocking not just from around the country, but from around the world to come to Death Valley to experience this extreme heat. I live in Wisconsin. From Virginia. We're from Connecticut. All of them is from Italy. Some of those folks taking a trip to escape their own heat, only to come experience this even hotter heat. So Scottsdale's been blazing hot so far this summer. A lot of days over 110, 115. So on our way to Brookings, we left this morning, we decided we uh, go out of our way to come to Death Valley and go down to uh, Badwater Basin, where I think it's supposed to be 120 this afternoon. For some, midweek highs in the 120s just aren't enough. Surprisingly, so far not bad because we've been at 120 and uh, around Page. So we want to get the 130s and get, get a feel for it. I'm hoping as hard as it gets. Even 140, I just want to get a feel for it. I'm in it. But for others, not so much. Heat. <laughs> the heat. Well, it's... <laughs> at least we are not going to die. <laughs> we got hope. With so many people experiencing this heat, you'd think there'd be a higher risk of heat-related emergencies. But so far, that has not been the case. Times we have the most problems with heat-related injuries are when it's hot, but not insanely hot. And that's when people get lulled into thinking, oh, it's cool enough, I can go for a one-mile walk, that'll be okay, when it's 118 degrees. But even as temperatures back away from those extreme record readings, people are still coming out to see what the attraction of Death Valley is all about. These record temperatures are what draw some people to experience something different from what they've ever experienced in their lives. Just, just beautiful, fantastic. I mean, finally, it's like a wish come true. For AccuWeather, I'm meteorologist Tony Lawback. You could see it coming. It was very fast moving. It did not take long for it to cover the countryside. On Thursday evening, a destructive line of storms barreled from Nebraska into South Dakota with wind gusts topping 100 miles per hour. These storms were monsters, filling the south and west skies with ominous clouds and dense dust as they tore through town after town. Well, we were walking our dog and she decided to turn around. So thank you, dog. <laughs> And then we just hightailed it back to our house and neighbors came over, we all got in the cellar. Wind gusts greater than 80 miles per hour ripped through the small town of Arlington, about 20 miles west of Brookings, South Dakota, and they were hit quick. It was uh, very forceful, uh, very dark. Um, it was very quiet right up till the wind hit, uh, almost instantaneous. Tree branches and roof shingles, stuff started coming off the structures, so it uh, hit pretty hard. You could hear it hail. And yeah. you could hear the wind. It sounded like the winds were ripping through. I thought it was a tornado. I've never heard a tornado, but that was nasty. Straight line winds tore roofs from homes, knocked chimneys off houses, blew down trees, and scattered debris in the streets. But it didn't take long for folks to come together and start clearing the mess from the roads. We're getting this community back in shape. We're getting that cleaned up now. We have done a uh, search of the town to make sure that everyone is okay. So far, everyone is 10-4, is and, and that's, that's good. For AccuWeather, I'm meteorologist Tony Lawback. North of Trescott. North of Trescott. Tornado on the ground. Wednesday evening brought multiple tornadoes to northwest Texas. Most, like this one south of Crowell, remained over mostly rural and unpopulated areas, doing little to no damage. But as night fell, one of those tornadoes took a hard left turn south of the town of Lockett. Well, when I looked up, it was literally right here at the house. Jason and his family live two miles south of town. They rushed to their basement, and within seconds, their lives would be changed forever. It, it, you heard the big ruckus upstairs, and by the time it ended that, I could smell insulation, so I knew my roof was gone. His home, along with every building on his property, were total losses. But the tornado took aim on the small town next. I had friends of mine call me and say, hey, dude, I said, this thing's fixing to hit, lock it head on, take cover. David rode out the tornado in his self-built tornado shelter. When he came out, he immediately ran to help his neighbors. Emergency management people out there, we all went out there and helped her. We had to cut the fence, get her out. Uh, I was just more worried about my neighbors than I was anything else. But the helping won't end there. People from all over have responded to help those who will be working through this for a very long time. Everybody's checked on us. Everybody's come by and offered to help. The neighbors take care of us. I mean, you know, all of our, you know, with the equipment down, uh, we've had farmers offer, you know, if, if we need some farming done, they're, they're, you know, they're, they've got their equipment to do it. And so, that it's, I mean, it's a great community to live in. Um, so I, I can't ask for anything better than that. 
For AccuWeather, I'm meteorologist Tony Lawback. Residents of Agency, Missouri are used to the Platte River flooding into town, but this time it caught them off guard. It came up fast. That was, it was rising really, that was coming up really fast to take that many acres in. This was due to a combination of rain here and upstream. All the water from up north, 14 inches of rain came down the, the Platte River, and when it gets down here, bottlenecks and floods out the town. I was down here in a few hours, the road was already over, and then I come back in another few hours, and this road was blocked. Several ways in and out of the town of Agency, all of them ending just like this, making parts of the town completely inaccessible, at least by car. My neighbor is on his way with his bass boat to take me to my home. Something she says was not necessary the night before. My neighbor was able to drive me from the north side to my house. Um, you can't get into my house with a vehicle now. And all this just to get to work. I'm just trying to get my to my house to get my dog, pack my bags so I can go to work tonight. Even though the residents of this small town are used to flooding, the speed of which the water came up will have them all remembering this one for a long time to come. This came up within six hours, probably. I believe we were all shocked by this one. Yeah, definitely. You know, we knew the rain was coming, but we didn't expect this. The Platte River is expected to fall below flood stage sometime on Monday, but showers and storms through the week may slow that progress. Keep up to date with the forecast in your area with AccuWeather's four-hour minute cast available when you download the app. For AccuWeather, I'm meteorologist Tony Lawback. We are talking about snow or the lack thereof. And we are in the midst of a snowless streak right now. I have lived right in now. Denver for a good majority of my adult life. And I feel like just about every year about this time, I can look back and think of a snowstorm we've already had with 10 inches plus. And here we're just struggling As to we make wrap a change. Meteorological fall. Many locations in eastern Colorado have yet to see their first measurable snow of the season. And finally, on December 10th, it happened. Denver measured three-tenths of an inch of snow, the first measurable snow of the season, and that was all the city would see through December 30th. Going into New Year's Eve, the city was nearly 20 inches below average to that date, but as the calendar turned to 2022, so did the snow season. Since December 31st, Denver has measured 34.6 inches of snow, most of that falling in January and February. Near weekly snowstorms close to doubled the average amount of snow seen in the first two months of the year and has all but made up the entire deficit of snow. But it wasn't just Denver. Most of northeast Colorado was also in a snow drought until New Year's. In fact, some areas in northern Colorado have had snow on the ground nonstop since 2022 started, despite recent spring teases. March is typically the snowiest month across the northern Colorado Front Range, with places like Denver averaging nearly a foot. Then April follows up with the second highest snow average. Oftentimes, it's one or two big snows that make up that number, unlike January and February, which mostly saw light to moderate totals in each of the nearly weekly storms. It was hard to imagine even getting close to normal this year after a record snow drought that took the first half of the season. Now the region prepares for what the next two months will bring, a season that currently sits at average, but has been anything but. For AccuWeather, I'm meteorologist Tony Lawback.